Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the April installment of Bracewell's Environmental Essentials for In-House Council webinar series. I'm Whit Swift with Bracewell's Environmental Strategy, Strategies Group here in Austin, and I'm happy to say that since we're talking about communications this morning, we have a true pro in the field, Christine Wyman, who's with the firm's Policy Resolution Group in Washington, D.C., joining us. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning, Christine. Good morning. Thanks for having me. For those of you who have dialed into a number of our monthly webinars, sometimes they focus on hot topics in environmental law, uh, and other times the webinars have covered more general topics aimed uh, not necessarily at a new development, but at a particular issue that's likely to be faced by environmental professionals or in-house lawyers with environmental responsibilities. Uh, this month, we are at another one of those general presentations, again, focused on communicating with government agencies. If you have any questions during our brief talk this morning, you can submit them using the online tool. We'll get to those questions that we can during our half hour, uh, and if not, we'll follow up with you afterward. So uh, be sure, don't, don't worry if we don't get to you in our 30 minutes. We often run right up to the end, but we will follow up if you have some questions. And uh, uh, one other note before we dive in, um, let, let me take this opportunity to invite you to join us next month in Houston for Bracewell's semi-annual environmental seminar. It's set for Wednesday, May 8th, and our keynote speaker will be the head of EPA's air office, uh, Bill Wareham. So again, please mark your calendars for Wednesday, May 8th, and plan, us to, plan to join us then in Houston. To the topic at hand, uh, Bracewell uh, has done a number of different lunch and learn training type programs uh, with environmental clients that touch on a number of aspects of environmental uh, agency relationships and effective communications. And this morning what we've done is essentially pull some of the key parts of those topics and, and try to put them into a single 30-minute presentation that hits on the highlights. Uh, given the nature of the webinar and our firm commitment to be done in 30 minutes, we're not going to get into extensive detail about any one topic, but uh, this morning's webinar will cover some of the key points that we think are worth talking about in your communications with government regulators, and also that you know in-house environmental management in-house environmental lawyers will want to focus on when training your staff and your direct reports, those who interact with agencies as part of their general uh, job duties and on a day-to-day -day basis. This morning's talk uh, will focus on agency communications really in two primary contexts. First, written communications and reportings, and second, agency meetings. We're going to cover general principles for effective communications, some special topics about email, which is always an interesting one, uh, responding to agency information requests and reports, then talk a little bit about having effective agency meetings. And then last, Christine is gonna talk about an important aspect of agency communications, that these are also essentially public communications that will more or less live forever as government records that can be reviewed by your neighbors, your opponents in litigation, or really anyone else who's interested to make the effort. So that's our topic list for today, and we'll move right in. Uh, those of us who write for a living uh, take much of this for granted, and we've been sort of trained in the ways of effective communications from the start of our careers. But I, I think it's helpful, particularly if you think about all of the different uh, chains of communication that go back and forth between uh, the regulated community and the regulators or a government agency, that those front lines in agency communications are often engineers who are focused more on understanding how things work and solving problems than they are on communicating it effectively. I, I will say I think that um, you know there has been a concerted effort o over the the course of my career to improve communication skills and focus on it through things like this. 
Um, but that's really what we're talking about here are, you know, training that we've done aimed at helping those folks who aren't necessarily focused on communicating and effective communications with agency, helping those folks do a better job in their communications with regulators. Uh, some general observations that we share, uh, you know, first, on, on all of this, talking about written communications, they live forever. They're going to be in those government aid, government files forever. They can present real compliance risks when you're talking about, in, you know, compliance issues and, uh, and situations where you may have uh, not achieved compliance or may have questions or challenges with whether or not you're meeting permit terms and conditions. Those, uh, you can have real consequences there as far as legal liability, you know, reputation of the company, and relationship with, relationships with your state or federal regulators. And another key aspect here is internal commu communications will not necessarily remain internal. They can be produced in litigation. They can be produced in response to government investigations. Uh, or they can be inadvertently sent to the government uh, in any number of contexts. You know, those of us who've done, who've practiced in uh, administrative litigation, the contested case hearings, I've certainly had instances where we dealt with uh, emails, internal emails typically, that we, we really would rather not have to deal with that have been produced because they are, uh, you know, generated by or sent to a person who's a witness in uh, about the facts or about the even an expert witness in a contested permit proceeding and those those communications that were thought to be internal can prove a real challenge once a person is being cross-examined about them in that kind of administrative litigation context the last point here uh, the importance of privilege and having the team understand how privileges work how they apply and and to which types of communications we can cl legitimately claim a legal privilege. That really is a whole topic or topics unto itself. Um, those of you who participated in the webinar in January uh, had a session on just that topic, privilege. Uh, because we just talked about it, we're not going to get into privilege issues in any detail today, but that is certainly a very important aspect of the training that we've often done with folks uh, about communicating with agencies and effective communications is, you know, what those privileges are, how they apply, and how we can maintain them for key communications. The same principles that apply to Effective external communications in any context will also apply to agency communications. And, and, and this is really thinking here about how you, how you structure your written communications with an agency. You state the purpose up front, be as brief as you can. If that's impossible, provide a summary. Long communications, uh, another thing I think that is important to do is, is to focus on readability. You know, long, unbroken pages of paragraphs of text tend to lose the reader. You need to break that up with white space, subheadings. Um, you know, I, I, you really want to try to focus on longer documents on readability. But then also, um, you know, again, going back to folks who may not be communicating or that's really not the focus of, of their job is, you know, formality and professionalism. These things need to be good. They need to be proofread. They need to look good and they need to have sort of a uniform method of communicating. Things that come from our company, we want them to look the same every time and we want them to be of the same quality every time. When you get to content, you know, be precise about what we're saying in these communications. Avoid speculation. We're going to talk about that further. Um, go back to that. And then, you know, wrapping up a communication. You want to make sure that the government knows what you believe the next steps are going to be and provides contact information for follow-up. Often these communications aren't the end of a chain, but rather 
the start or a midpoint. So those are the basic elements that that are really important for any communication, and they apply just as well when we're communicating with an agency about environmental issues. Email is a topic that, that really can make up its, its own session, and it's often one of the most fun topics because you can, uh, fun for the folks there, because you can pull up embarrassing emails that have come up in litigation context and the like, and get a few chuckles about it. Um, but it, it really is important. And given the nature of email and how, how so many of us do so much of our work over email now, it is, it is an important thing to go through, get reminders of the consequences or potential consequences of sending email and how we use email uh, in communicating both internally and with government regulators. First and foremost, you know, follow the same rules that you would if you were sending a letter. You know, the, the old form of communications. We've got to treat email like a formal business communication. Second, avoid four words. Um, I, I guess the same rule that you apply to the uh, uh, emails that you might get from your non-PC uncle, uh, Think of, this, think of it the same way when you're dealing with the government. You know, if you're communicating with somebody with the government, send them an email that you've sent. Four words, and, and I've seen specific examples of it in my practice. You know, when you rely on a foreword, you may not read deep enough into that foreword, and you might forward one thing that you wanted, and you forward either superfluous or, or even damaging information if you're forwarding an email chain to a government regulator. Avoid forwards. We've also talked with folks about particular considerations for internal email messages. Uh, most importantly, and, and a lot of this is, is because of this, internal email may not necessarily stay internal. As we discussed earlier, there are various means, whether it's through a government investigation, through discovery, through inadvertent disclosure, that those internal documents may not stay internal. So when sending emails around, employees should assume that they're, treat, treat it like you were preparing a memo to the file or, or a letter. Assume that email is forever. And you know, in that light, avoid the use of sarcasm, humor, uh, and, and also, email can often be the wrong forum for discussing difficult compliance issues. You know, in the context of email, one, of course, these emails will stay around forever and they may end up being discoverable in some context. But really, you know, an email exchange often doesn't provide sufficient background or context particularly in a situation where pieces of the email are subsequently being used in litigation. Um, oftentimes when people are exchanging emails, you know, it's rapid back and forth and the thoughts aren't fully thought out before sending. And, and, and so you really can get, when you get into discussing compliance issues, you can, you can create a, a record that looks bad and that is also misleading with internal email discussions of compliance issues. We always want to uh, use the good old fashioned telephone and teleconference uh, to discuss those types of compliance issues. Moving to responding to agency uh, information requests or agency reports some general principles that we've talked about um, with folks. First, you know, always assume an enforcement purpose is behind the, the either the report that is that you're preparing or the response to the information request that you are writing up. Understand the consequence and tailor the response to, to those, uh, to the context of the submittal. Uh, what we're talking about here, uh, an example there would be um, filling out a response to a questionnaire to the TCEQ 
about an emissions event. You know, the context of that request is there are regulatory standards that the agency is going to review in evaluating whether or not you meet an affirmative defense to enforcement. The folks that are working on those responses uh, need to be aware of what those affirmative defense criteria are in Chapter 101, and let's tailor the response to those requests, to those uh, regulatory standards. When you're in, and this in particular uh, is in responding to government information requests, eliminate uncertainty or ambiguity. You know, back at the, the, the first slide talked about how precision is important. Well, here, you know, this is reiterating that point. Precision is important in these communications. If there's uncertainty as to what you have been asked or uncertainty or ambiguity in the terms, uh, get them defined in advance or, uh, you know, take an interpretation and explain it. That's often the approach that I like to take with folks in responding to a government information request um, is, you know, and take, an, take an interpretation, even take a narrow interpretation, and, and, and I'm completely comfortable doing so if, it, if it's going to limit the scope of the response. But the other thing that I want to do is I want to explain what position we took in the submittal. A, a, a real reason for doing that is, uh, particularly in dealing with the federal government and information requests, you'll get uh, a request to have a uh, some form of certification of truth, accuracy, and completeness in the uh, information request. And uh, I, I am always comfortable taking a, a narrow interpretation or a hard line that would limit the scope of our response, but I want to explain that in the body of the response because then I am comfortable that uh, my certifying official is not going to get crosswise with the government to the extent that they intended to get additional information or more information than we're actually including in our response. Uh, along those same lines, uh, provide only the required or requested information. You know, filling out a response to a questionnaire or responding to an information request is not the context to provide additional information that uh, you think the government might be interested in, but they didn't specifically ask for. Uh, similarly, no point in, in, and avoid any speculation about causes or information that's not known. You know, give information that's known when it's not known, say so. But uh, no point in speculating and certainly, you know, read the questions closely focus on precisely what, they're, what they have requested and give just that information and nothing more. Uh, one other, uh, particularly this is gonna be in the context of a, you know, an EPA uh, Clean Air Act or Clean Water Act information request, look for objectionable questions or objectionable approaches in the information request. Uh, they often will have objectionable approaches, uh, but I think it's one where you pick your battles. You know, we, we really hear sometimes you, you've I, I have seen forms of information responses to information requests where a company will will, you know, in response to every question, the first the first paragraph of their answer is a handful of largely empty objections that the company actually then doesn't rely on. But they just, they kind of always do it that way and they object that it's overbroad and unduly burdensome and uh, blah, blah, blah. And then they just dive right in and, and give a, a, a complete response. You know, I, I really think a, a smarter approach is to, you know, pick your fights, look for something that is truly objectionable. And when it is objectionable, call it out and, and stand on the objection. And if part of the question is not objectionable, provide that. But if you're going to object, you know, object when you have a real grounds for objection. And when you do so, stand on it. Um, we've had success with that, with government information requests in the past. You know, we had one a few years ago where the government sent an information request that almost read like a uh, request for admissions uh, that you'd see in litigation, where it, it was 
uh, it was sent in the context or under the authority of Section 114 of the Clean Air Act, but it said, uh, regard to these facts that the government thought it had uncovered in an on-site inspection, um, admit that uh, this is a violation of, uh, you know, Section blah, 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 Part 68, or if not, explain why it is not a violation. And we objected to that completely. We did not play ball with this sort of request for admissions type of information request. And it was effective in that um, we did not hear further from the government in response to that uh, following our response. They actually did not pursue enforcement and we avoided creating a series of admissions which is what the government was looking for when they when EPA Region 9 sent us that request. Last, shifting gears here real quick. Um, you know, uh, another thing that we've talked about with, with, with our clients in these training sessions, in addition to written communications with agency, is agency meetings. A lot of this, you know, really you'll see that the same principles basically apply, but Agency meetings are, are important. You'll have them in the context of permitting. You'll have them in the context of regulatory advocacy. You'll have them in the context of enforcement and enforcement defense. And I think there are important principles that you always want to uh, uh, get your team uh, aware of and get everybody on the same page when you've got an agency meeting uh, coming up. You want clarity on the purpose and the goals of the meeting. What are we trying to get from this meeting? What do we want uh, the agency to do to us or to stop doing to us? What do we want them to give us? Be organized and prepared, of course. Have, a, have an external agenda. Have internal detailed talking points. Have assigned roles. Um, you know, have all that ready in advance. Meet with the right people. Uh, you know, understand you know, the agency structure, the agency hierarchy, and know who to meet with at the TCQ or at EPA. Uh, use a professional tone. This is something that's important in meetings, uh, which is, you know, you've got to be able to disagree with the agency without making it personal. Um, this is something, you know, I'm, I'm always asking the agency for something in these meetings, and I'm not always getting what I want. I don't think anyone is. And if you're always getting what you want, I, you're probably not asking for enough from the agency. Um, but you've got to be able to uh, have a team there that can, that can run into disagreements with the agency while still making it a productive meeting and not making it personal. Um, next, know where the agency stands when you walk out. This is something that's really important and we've been burned on this in the past as far as you know, walking out of an agency meeting thinking we had uh, uh, alignment on a particular position and then finding out when a permit application went in two months later that the sort of quiet nods that we took as agreement with us in the meeting were not actually, uh, we did not have a meeting of the minds. And so this is something that I have been very focused on. You know, if, if the agency agrees with you, great. If the agency disagrees with you, not great, but you want to know that when you walk out of the meeting. You want to know where they stand. You want to confirm next steps going forward. Uh, last, and, and in preparing for this webinar, I talked to a few folks in management at the TCEQ Enforcement Division and uh, Office of Legal Services just because I was curious to see if they had any pet peeves or suggestions anything that would be interesting to, to add to, you know, our sort of basic uh, uh, materials about agency meetings. And they're, they're pretty similar to the previous slide, but a couple interesting things. Uh, but here you see them. Have an agenda. Have a plan. Uh, if you need more than an hour, tell them. You know, plan out your meeting. Don't get bogged down in the first topic. Eat up your whole time and then, uh, and then, you know, need to extend the meeting when these folks probably have other things to do. Um, respect the structure and chain of command at the agency. This was a big one. Uh, do not forum shop. Do not, you know, if you get a if you get an answer you don't want from one person, uh, don't call and set a meeting for someone else to in hopes of getting a better answer. Um, the agency might not become aware of it right away, but but they will find out about it soon enough. 
uh, more about tone. You know, don't come in defensive, condescending, attempt to intimidate folks from the agency, particularly new folks. Uh, those things generally backfire and, and uh, you know, folks' bosses will, will be in their corner. Um, one other thing they said is, you know, just recognize that agency positions can evolve over time. So if you come in pounding the agency over the head with, well, this is how we've always do, this is how you always do things, uh, you know, those things can change. Now with our, our last few minutes, um, I want to get back to this thought of written communication, <laughs> going back to our written communications. And let's have Christine talk a bit about this aspect of agency communications as public communications. Sure, thanks so much, Witt. So Witt's provided a lot of good advice and expertise on best practices for communicating with regulators. But I'm here to remind you that any time that you're communicating with a regulatory agency, you should treat that communication like you're communicating with the, pub with the public. And that's because any email or written communications, as well as advocacy materials that you provide it to the agency, are going to be considered agency records that are subject to disclosure under an Open, open Records Act, such as the Federal Freedom of Information Act, FOIA, or a state equivalent that would govern disclosure by state regulatory agencies. Uh, so how is it that your documents might be actually disclosed in this manner? Well, what happens is a member of the public is going to submit a request to the agency for records held by a particular employee or on a particular topic. And when the agency is reviewing the responsive documents, your documents, your email communications and your advocacy materials might be considered responsive to that request. And if so, and if those documents um, are not uh, subject to uh, exemption for confidential business information or some other um, privilege, then those documents are going to be produced by the agency. And I think it's important to keep in mind that in particular with federal agencies like EPA, when they're disclosing these materials, they're not just providing them to the person or entity that submitted the FOIA request. They're actually now providing them, um, they're putting them up on a website online. And so really anybody has the opportunity to peruse those documents and see what's in there. Uh, so, so why though is there a concern? Um, I think there's a few reasons that we need to keep in mind in advance of having any communications with the agency, um, just so that we're, we're going into it with our, our best foot forward. Um, first, there's always a potential for disclosure of confidential business information. Um, you do have the ability to designate and substantiate those claims, but you have to be mindful to do that. And you have to be mindful, too, of you know, that you're not submitting maybe your vendors or your contractors uh, confidential business information. And it's important to remember, too, that EPA is going to be the ultimate decider on whether or not the information that you submit is a confidential business, is confidential business information. And so, you know, you're going to have to possibly work with the agency on, on limiting the scope there. Second, even when information is not considered confidential business information, if your um, communications with the agency or advocacy documents are disclosed through a FOIA request, they might provide your competitors with insight on project status or advocacy priorities, things that you know you might not want everybody to know. And then third, I think there's a real damn potential uh, for reputational harm. And that's because we're seeing FOIA uh, being used increasingly at the federal level, and especially here in DC, to establish um, that there are improper, or to try to make the case that there are improper industry agency relationships going on. And really here, um, they're just using the, the fact that there are communications between industry and agency um, to, to make the point that there is some sort of improper relationship. So keeping all that in mind, um, we think it's just important to, to make sure that you're using some good hygiene when you are communicating with your agency regulators. Um, in particular, um, with emails, just be mindful of the tone, extraneous information, a lot of the things that Witt has mentioned, and really draft all your emails like they could end up being published in the New York Times. Um, second, you know, making sure that you're marking any CBI, confidential business information, um, and being mindful that there are agency-specific regulations and statutes that govern the treatment of confidential business information and the procedure by which you would um, substantiate those claims. So I think with that, we have come to the, the end of our time. Um, we thank you all for joining us for this uh, installment of the Environmental Essentials webinar. 
Um, for those of you that have asked questions, we will respond to those questions through email. Um, so please do send them to us and I'll put our contact information up for, for your reference. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you.